they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god and even as they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind romans one twenty twenty one twenty eight unless the guilt of the pagan world can be proved the missionary enterprises of the christian church from the days of the apostles to the present time have all been a waste of labour nay more if the sin and ill desert of the entire human race in all its generations cannot be established then the christian religion itself involving the incarnation of god is an attempt to supply a demand that has no real existence both theoretical and practical christianity stands or falls with the doctrine of the universal guilt of man it is no wonder therefore that the apostle paul in the opening of the most systematic and logical treatise in the new testament the epistle to the romans enters upon a line of argument to demonstrate the ill desert of every human creature without exception and to prove that before an unerring tribunal and in the final day of adjudication every mouth must be stopped and all the world become guilty before god in conducting his argument the apostle relies upon two facts in particular to establish his position the first is that however dim or imperfect man's knowledge of god and the moral law may be he nevertheless knows more than he puts in practice of the millions of idolaters in cultivated greece and rome and the millions of idolaters in that barbaric world which lay outside of the greco-roman civilization he affirms that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god and the second fact upon which he founds his charge of guilt is that the dim perception of god and the moral law as well as the idolatrous notions that were formed upon these subjects both alike originated in the wicked inclination of the heart these pagans he says did not like to retain god in their knowledge and therefore god gave them over to a reprobate mind the apostle vindicates the ways of god in the condemnation of man because human conscience be it much or little is always in advance of human character and also because all the various forms of human error respecting divine being and attributes all the idolatry and superstition of the barbaric races of mankind originate not in man's created and rational constitution but in the sin of his apostate and corrupt heart these two facts in the judgment of st paul justify the damnation of the heathen and to their examination we now proceed under the light of st paul's inspiration and reasoning one the idea of god is the most important and comprehensive of all the ideas of which the human mind is possessed it is the foundation of religion of all right doctrine and all right conduct a correct intuition of it leads to correct religious theories and practice while any erroneous or defective view of the supreme being will pervade the whole domain of religion and exert a most pernicious influence upon the character and conduct of men it is this great idea of the deity inborn and constitutional to the human mind which st paul seizes and he flashes its penetrating light into the recesses of the pagan heart he traces back the horrible depravity of the heathen world which he depicts with a pen as sharp as that of juvenal but with none of juvenal's bitterness and vitriolic sarcasm to a distorted and false conception of the divine being and attributes but he does not for an instant concede that this distorted and false conception is founded on the original structure and constitution of the human soul and that this moral ignorance is necessary and inevitable to the pagan this mutilated idea of the supreme being was not inlaid in the rational creature on that morning of creation when god said let us make man in our image after our likeness on the contrary the apostle affirms that in the moral constitution of a rational soul and in the works of creation and providence the creator has given to all men the media to a correct idea of himself and asserts by implication that if they had always employed these media they would have always possessed this idea 
the wrath of god he says is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of god is manifest in them for god hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him even his eternal power and godhead are clearly seen from the creation of the world being understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god this is said be it remembered of the pagan world and from this reasoning it appears that the pagan mind has not kept what was committed to it it has not employed the moral instrumentalities nor elicited the moral truths with which it has been furnished this reasoning implies that the pagan man by his constitutional structure knows more of his maker than he puts in practice that he possesses a talent which he hides in the earth that he has a pound which he keeps laid up in a napkin when napoleon was returning from his campaign in egypt and syria he was seated one night upon the deck of the vessel under the open canopy of the heavens surrounded by his captains and generals the conversation had taken a sceptical direction and most of the party had combated the doctrine of the divine existence napoleon sat silent and musing apparently taking no interest in the discussion when suddenly raising his hand and pointing at the crystalline firmament crowded with its mildly shining planets and its keen glittering stars he broke out in those startling tones that so often electrified a million of men gentlemen who made all that the eternal power and godhead of the creator are impressed by the things that are made and these words of napoleon to his atheistic captains silence them and the same impression is made the world over go to-day into the heart of africa or into the centre of new holland select the most imbruted pagan that can be found take him out under a clear starlit heaven and ask him who made all that and the idea of a superior being superior to all his fetishes and idols possessing eternal power and godhead immediately emerges in his consciousness the instant the missionary takes this lustful idolater away from the circle of his idols and brings him face to face with the heavens and the earth as napoleon brought his captains the constitutional idea dawns again and the pagan trembles before the unseen power but it will be objected that it is a very dim and inadequate idea of the deity that thus rises in the pagan's mind and that therefore the apostle's affirmation that he is without excuse for being an idolater and a sensualist needs some qualification this imbruted creature says the objector certainly does not possess the metaphysical conception of god as a spirit and of all his various attributes like the dweller in christendom how then can he be brought in guilty before the same eternal bar and be condemned to the same eternal death with the nominal christian the answer is plain and decisive and derivable out of the apostle's own statements in order to establish the guiltiness of a rational creature before the bar of god it is not necessary to show that he has lived in the seventh heavens and under a blaze of moral intelligence like that of the archangel gabriel it is only necessary to show that he has enjoyed some degree of moral light and that he has not lived up to it any creature who knows more than he practices is a guilty creature if the light in the pagan's intellect concerning god and the moral law small though it be is yet actually in advance of the inclination and affections of his heart and the actions of his life he deserves to be punished like any and every other creature under the divine government of whom the same thing is true grades of knowledge vary indefinitely no two men upon the planet no two men in christendom itself possess precisely the same degree of moral intelligence there are men walking in the streets of this city to-day under the full light of the christian revelation whose notions respecting god and law are exceedingly dim and inadequate and there are others whose views are clear and accurate in a high degree but there is not a person in this city young or old ignorant or cultivated in the purlieus of vice or in the saloons of wealth whose knowledge of god is not in advance of his character 
ask the young thief in the subterranean haunts of vice and crime if he does not know more of moral truth than he puts in practice and if he renders an honest answer it is in the affirmative ask the most besotted soul immersed and petrified in pleasure if his career upon earth has been in accordance with his own knowledge and conviction of what is right and required by his maker and he will answer no if he answers truly this is the condemnation that light in varying degrees it is true but always in some degree falls upon the pathway of every man but he loves darkness rather than light because his heart and deeds are evil and this principle will be applied to the pagan world in the day of the great winding up of human history it is so applied by st paul he himself concedes that the gentile has not enjoyed all the advantages of the jew and argues that the ungodly jew will be visited with a more severe punishment than the ungodly gentile but he expressly affirms that the pagan is under law and knows what he is that he shows the work of the law that is written in his heart his conscience also bearing witness and his thoughts the meanwhile accusing him but the knowledge of the law implies the knowledge of god in an equal degree who can feel himself amenable to a moral law without at the same time thinking of its author the law and the lawgiver are indivisible the one is the mirror and index of the other if the eye opens dimly upon the commandment it opens dimly upon the sovereign if it sees eternal right and law with clear and celestial vision it then looks directly into the face of god law and god are correlative to each other and just so far consequently as the heathen understands the law that is written on the heart does he apprehend the being who sitteth upon the circle of the heavens who impinges himself upon the consciousness of man this being so it is plain that we can confront the ungodly pagan with the same charge of guilt before the eternal judge with which we confront the ungodly nominal christian we can tell him with positiveness wherever we find him be it under the burning zone of africa or in the frozen home of the eskimo that he knows more than he puts in practice we will concede to him that the quantum of his moral knowledge is very stinted and meagre but in the same breath we will remind him that small as it is he has not lived up to it that he too has come short that he too knowing god in the dimmest faintest degree has yet not glorified him as god in the slightest faintest manner the bible sends the ungodly and licentious pagan to hell upon the same principle that it sends the ungodly and licentious nominal christian it is the just principle enunciated by our lord christ the judge of quick and dead when he says he who knew his master's will clearly and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes and he who knew not his master's will clearly but knew it dimly and did it not shall be beaten with few stripes it is the just principle enunciated by st paul that as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law the present and future condition of the heathen world is a subject that has enlisted the interest of two very different classes of men the church of god has pondered and laboured and prayed over this subject and will continue to do so till the millennium and the disbeliever in revelation has also turned his mind to the consideration of this black mass of ignorance and misery which welters upon the globe like a chaotic ocean these teeming millions of barbarians and savages who render the aspect of the world so sad and so dark the church we need not say have accepted the biblical theory and have traced the wretched condition of the pagan world as st paul does to their sin and transgression they have held that every pagan is a rational creature and by virtue of this fact has known something of the moral law and that to the extent of the knowledge he has had he is as guilty for the transgression of law as is really under its condemnation as the dweller under the light of revelation and civilization they have maintained that every human creature has enjoyed sufficient light in the workings of natural reason and conscience 
and in the impressions that are made by the glory and the terror of the natural world above and around him to bring him in guilty before the everlasting judge for this reason the church has denied that the pagan is an innocent creature or that he can stand in the judgment before the searcher of hearts for this reason the church has believed the declaration of the apostle john that the whole world lieth in wickedness and has endeavoured to obey the command of him who came to redeem pagans as much as nominal christians to go and preach the gospel to every creature because every creature is a guilty creature but the disbeliever in revelation adopts the theory of human innocency and looks upon all the ignorance and wretchedness of paganism as he does upon the suffering decay and death in the vegetable and animal world it is the necessary condition he asserts of all created existence and as decay and death in the vegetable and animal worlds only result in a more luxurious vegetation and an increased multiplication of living creatures so the evils and woes of the hundreds of generations and the millions of individuals during the sixty centuries that have elapsed since the origin of man will all of them minister to the ultimate and everlasting weal of the race there is no need therefore he maintains of endeavouring to save such feeble and ignorant beings from judicial condemnation and eternal penalty such finiteness and helplessness cannot be put into relations to such an awful attribute as the eternal nemesis of god can it be he asks that the millions upon millions that have been born lived their brief hour enjoyed their little joys and suffered their sharp sorrows and then dropped into the dark backward and abysm of time have really been guilty creatures and have gone down to an endless hell but what does all this reasoning and querying imply will the objector really take the position and stand to it that the pagan man is not a rational and responsible creature that he does not possess sufficient knowledge of moral truth to justify his being brought to the bar of judgment will he say that the population that knew enough to build the pyramids did not know enough to break the law of god will he affirm that the civilization of babylon and nineveh of greece and rome did not contain within it enough of moral intelligence to constitute a foundation for future rewards and punishments will he tell us that the people of sodom and gomorrah stood upon the same plain with the brutes that perish and the trees of the field that rot and die having no idea of god knowing nothing of the distinction between right and wrong and never feeling the pains of an accusing conscience will he maintain that the populations of india in the midst of whom one of the most subtle and ingenious systems of pantheism has sprung up with the luxuriance and involutions of one of their own jungles and which has innovated the whole religious sentiment of the hindu race as opium has innovated their physical frame will he maintain that such an untiring and persistent mental activity as this is incapable of apprehending the first principles of ethics and natural religion which in comparison with the complicated and obscure ratiocinations of buddhism are clear as water and lucid as atmospheric air in other connections this theorist does not speak in this style in other connections and for a different purpose he enlarges upon the dignity of man of every man and eulogizes the power of reason which so exalts him in the scale of being with hamlet he dilates in proud and swelling phrase what a piece of work is man how noble in reason how infinite in faculties in form and moving how express and admirable in action how like an angel in apprehension how like a god the beauty of the world the paragon of animals it is from that very class of theorizers who deny that the heathen are in danger of eternal perdition and who represent the whole missionary enterprise as a work of supererogation that we receive the most extravagant accounts of the natural powers and gifts of man now if these powers and gifts do belong to human nature by its constitution they certainly lay a foundation for responsibility and all such theorists must be able to show that the pagan has made a right use of them and has thought and acted in conformity with this large amount of truth and reason with which according to their own statement he is endowed 
or else they consign him, as St. Paul does, to the wrath of God which is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. If you assert that the pagan man has had no talents at all committed to him, and can prove your assertion, you are consistent in denying that he can be summoned to the bar of God, and be tried for everlasting life or death. But if you concede that he has had one talent or two talents committed to his charge, and still more, if you exaggerate his gifts and endow him with five or ten talents, then it is impossible for you to save him from the retributions to come, except you can prove a perfect administration and use of the trust. And this brings us to the consideration of the second fact upon which St. Paul rests his position that the pagan world is in a state of condemnation. He concedes that man outside of the pale of revelation is characterized not indeed by total but by great ignorance of God and divine things, that this moral knowledge is exceedingly dim and highly distorted, but the fault is in himself that it is so. As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The question very naturally arises, and is frequently urged by the unbeliever, how comes it to pass that the knowledge of God, of which the Apostle speaks, and which he affirms to be innate and constitutional to the human mind, should become so vitiated in the pagan world? The majority of mankind are polytheists and idolaters, and have been for thousands of years. Can it be that St. Paul is correct in affirming that the doctrine that there is only one God is native to the human mind, that the pagan knows this God and yet does not glorify him as God? The majority of mankind are earthly and sensual and have been for thousands of years. Can it be that St. Paul is correct in saying that there is a moral law written upon their heart forbidding such carnality and enjoining purity and holiness? some theorizers argue that because the pagan man does not obey the law therefore he does not know the law and that because he has not revered and worshipped the one supreme deity therefore he does not possess the idea of such a being they look out upon the pagan populations and see them bowing down to stocks and stones and witness their immersion in the abominations of heathenism and conclude that these millions of rational beings really know no better and that therefore it is unjust to hold them responsible for their polytheism and moral corruption. But why do they confine this species of reasoning to the pagan world? Why do they not bring it into nominal Christendom and apply it there? Why does not this theorist go into the midst of European civilization, into the heart of London or Paris, and gauge the moral knowledge of the sensualist by the moral character of the sensualist? why does he not tell us that because this civilized man acts no better that therefore he knows no better why does he not maintain that because his voluptuary breaks all the commandments in the decalogue therefore he must be ignorant of all the commandments in the decalogue that because he neither fears nor loves the one only god therefore he does not know that there is any such being it will never do to estimate man's moral knowledge by man's moral character he knows more than he practices. And there is not so much difference in this particular between some men in nominal Christendom and some men in heathendom as is sometimes imagined. The moral knowledge of those who lie in the lower strata of Christian civilization and those who lie in the higher strata of paganism is probably not so very far apart. Place the embruted outcasts of our metropolitan population beside the Indian hunter with his belief in the great spirit and his worship without images or pictorial representations, beside the stalwart Mandingo of the high table plains of Central Africa with his active and enterprising spirit, carrying on manufactures and trades with all the keenness of any civilized worldling beside the native merchants and lawyers of calcutta who still cling to their ancestral buddhism or else substitute french infidelity in its place place the lowest of the highest beside the highest of the lowest and tell us if the difference is so very marked sin like holiness is a mighty leveller the dislike to retain God in the consciousness, the aversion of the heart toward the purity of the moral law, vitiates the native perceptions alike in Christendom and paganism. 
the theory that the pagan is possessed of such an amount and degree of moral knowledge as has been specified has awakened some apprehensions in the minds of some christian theologians and has led them unintentionally to foster the opposite theory which if strictly adhered to would lift off all responsibility from the pagan world would bring them in innocent to the bar of god and would render the whole enterprise of christian missions a superfluity and an absurdity their motive has been good they have feared to attribute any degree of accurate knowledge of god and the moral law to the pagan world lest they should thereby conflict with the doctrine of total depravity they have erroneously supposed that if they should concede to every man by virtue of his moral constitution some correct apprehensions of ethics and natural religion it would follow that there is some native goodness in him but light in the intellect is very different from life and affection in the heart it is one thing to know the law of god and quite another thing to obey it even if we should concede to the degraded pagan or the degraded dweller in the haunts of vice in christian lands all the intellectual knowledge of god and the moral law that is possessed by the ruined archangel himself we should not be adding a particle to his moral character or his moral excellence there is nothing of a holy quality in the mere intellectual perception that there is one supreme being and that he has issued a pure and holy law for the guidance of all rational creatures the mere doctrine of the divine unity will save no man there is no redemptive power in it it forgives no sin and it delivers from no bondage to sin thou believest says st james that there is one god thou doest well the devils also believe and tremble satan himself is a monotheist and knows very clearly all the commandments of god but his heart and will are in demoniacal antagonism with them and so it is only in a lower degree in the instance of the pagan and of the natural man in every age and in every clime this intellectual perception therefore this constitutional apprehension of the first principles of natural religion instead of lifting up disobedient man into a higher and more favourable position before the eternal bar casts him down into a deeper perdition light that is abused ministers to a greater condemnation and the eternal judge will say to every man jew or gentile that has held any portion or degree of moral truth in unrighteousness as his apostle said to the unfaithful jew thou therefore that teachest another teachest thou not thyself thou that preachest a man should not steal dost thou steal thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery dost thou commit adultery if the heathen knew nothing at all of his maker and his duty he could not be held responsible and would not be summoned to judgment as st paul affirms where there is no law there is no transgression but if when he knew god in some degree he glorified him not as god to that degree and if when the moral law was written upon his heart he went counter to its requirements and actually heard the accusing voice of his own conscience after so doing then his mouth must be stopped and he must become guilty before his judge like any and every other disobedient creature it is this serious and damning fact in the history of man upon the globe that st paul brings to view in the affirmation that the pagan world did not like to retain god in their knowledge he accounts for all the idolatry and sensuality all the darkness and vain imaginations of paganism by referring them to the aversion of the natural heart the primary difficulty was in the affections of the pagan and not in his understanding he knew too much for his own comfort in sin the contrast between the divine purity that was mirrored in his conscience and the sinfulness that was wrought into his heart and will rendered this inborn constitutional idea of god a painful one it was a fire in the bones if the psalmist a renewed man yet not entirely free from human corruption could say i thought of god and was troubled much more must the totally depraved man of paganism be filled with terror when in the thoughts of his heart in the hour when the accusing conscience was at work he brought to mind the one great god of gods the vast unseen power whom he did not glorify and whom he had offended it was no wonder therefore that he did not like to retain the idea of such a being in his consciousness and that he adopted all possible expedients to get rid of it 
the apostle informs us that the pagan actually called in his imagination to his aid in order to extirpate if possible all his native and rational ideas and convictions upon religious subjects he became vain in his imaginations and his foolish heart as a consequence was darkened and he changed the glory of the incorruptible god the spiritual unity of the deity into an image made like to corruptible man and to beasts and four-footed beasts and creeping things he invented idolatry and all those gay religions full of pomp and gold in order to blunt the edge of that sharp spiritual conception of god which was continually cutting and lacerating his wicked and his sensual heart hiding himself amidst the columns of his idolatrous temples and under the smoke of his idolatrous incense he thought like adam to escape from the view and inspection of the infinite one who from the creation of the world downward makes known to all men his eternal power and godhead who as st paul taught the philosophers of athens is not far from any one of his rational creatures who as the same apostle taught the pagan lyconians though in time past he suffered all nations to walk in their own ways yet left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave them rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling their hearts with food and gladness the first step in the process of mutilating the original idea of god as a unity and an invisible spirit is seen in those pantheistic religions which lie behind all the mythologies of the ancient world like a nebulous vapour out of which the more distinct idols and images of paganism are struggling here the notion of the divine unity is still preserved but the divine personality and holiness are lost god becomes a vague impersonal power with no moral qualities and no religious attributes and it is difficult to say which is worst in its moral influence this pantheism which while retaining the doctrine of the divine unity yet denudes the deity of all that renders him an object of love and reverence or the grosser idolatries that succeeded it for man cannot love with all his mind and heart and soul and strength a vast force working blindly through infinite space and everlasting time and the second and last stage in the process of vitiating the true idea of god appears in that polytheism in the midst of which st paul lived and laboured and preached and died in that seductive and beautiful paganism that classical idolatry which still addresses the human taste in such a fascinating manner in the venus de medici and the apollo belvidere the idea of the unity of god is now mangled and cut up into the god's many and the lord's many into the thirty thousand divinities of the pagan pantheon this completes the process god now gives his guilty creatures over to those vain imaginations of naturalism sensualism and idolatry and to an increasingly darkening mind until in the lowest forms of heathenism he so distorts and suppresses the concreated idea of the deity that some speculatists assert that it does not belong to his constitution and that his maker never endowed him with it how is the gold become dim how is the most fine gold changed but it will be objected that all this lies in the past this is the account of a process that has required centuries yea millenniums to bring about a hundred generations have been engaged in transmuting the monotheism with which the human race started into the pantheism and polytheism in which the great majority of it is now involved how do you establish the guilt of those at the end of the line how can you charge upon the present generation of pagans the same culpability that paul imputed to their ancestors eighteen centuries ago and that noah the preacher of righteousness denounced upon the antediluvian pagan as the deteriorating process advances does not the guilt diminish and now in these ends of the ages and in these dark habitations of cruelty has not the culpability run down to a minimum which god in the day of judgment will wink at we answer no because in the first place the structure of the human society is precisely the same that it was when the sodomites held down the truth in unrighteousness and the roman populace turned up their thumbs that they might see the last drops of blood ebb slowly from the red gash in the dying gladiator's side man in his deepest degradation in his most hardened depravity is still a rational intelligence and though he should continue to sin on indefinitely 
through cycles of time as long as those of geology, he cannot unmake himself. He cannot unmold his immortal essence and absolutely eradicate all his moral ideas. Even paganism itself has its fluctuations of moral knowledge. The early Roman in the days of Numa was highly ethical in his views of the deity and his conceptions of moral law. Varro informs us that for a period of 170 years, the Romans worshipped their gods without any images, and Sallust denominates these pristine Romans religiosi simi mortales. How often does the missionary discover a tribe or a race whose moral intelligence is higher than that of the average of paganism? Nay, the same race or tribe passes from one phase of polytheism to another, in one instance exhibiting many of the elements and truths of natural religion, and in another almost entirely suppressing them. These facts prove that the pagan man is under supervision, that he is under the righteous despotism of moral ideas and convictions, that God is not far from him, that he lives and moves and has his being in his Maker, and that God does not leave himself without witness in his constitutional structure. Therefore it is that this sea of rational intelligence thus surges and sways in the masses of paganism, sometimes dashing the creature up to the heights, and sometimes sending him down into the depths. But we answer no to the question that is put by the objector for a second reason, that is still more conclusive, because it is still more practical. The guilt of the pagan cannot be reduced to a minimum and disappear, because wherever he is found, he is found to be self-willed and determined in sin. He does not like to retain truth in his mind or to obey it in his heart. Go into the centre of Africa today, select out the most imbruted heathen, bring to his remembrance that class of truths with which he is already acquainted, and add to them the still larger class that issue from revelation, and you will find that he is predetermined against them. He takes sides with all the depth and intensity of his being, with that sinfulness which is common to man, and which is the object of both ethics and the gospel, to oppose and remove. This pagan loves the sin which is forbidden, more than he loves the holiness that is commanded. We grant that the temptations that assail him are very powerful, but are not some of the temptations that beset any and every man very powerful. We grant that this wretched slave of vice and pollution cannot possibly break off his sins by righteousness without the renewing and sanctifying grace of God, but neither can any man in the heart of Christendom. He loves his chains and his bondage, even as every other sinner loves them, and this proves that his moral corruption is the same self-willed thing in principle with that of mankind in every age and grade of civilization. It is the rooted aversion of the human heart toward the purity and holiness of God. It is the carnal mind which is at enmity against God, and for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Ask the faithful and devoted missionaries who go down into these habitations of cruelty to pour more light into the mind, and to induce the pagan to leave his idols and his sensualism. Ask them if they find that sinful human nature is any different there from what it is elsewhere, so far as yielding to the claims of God and law is concerned. Do they tell you that they are uniformly successful in persuading these sinners to leave their sins? that they never find any self-will, any determined opposition to the holy law of purity, any preference of a life of license, with its woes here upon earth and hereafter in hell, to a life of self-denial with its joys eternal? On the contrary, they testify that the old maxim upon which so many millions of the human family in nominal Christendom act, enjoy the present and jump the life to come, is the rule for the mass of the heathen population, of whom so few can be persuaded to leave their idols and their lusts. Like the people of Israel, when expostulated with by the prophet Jeremiah for their idolatry and pollution, the majority of the pagan world, when endeavours have been made to reclaim them, have said to the missionary, There is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. There is not a single individual of them all, who has been necessitated to do wrong. Each one of them has a will of his own, and loves the sin that is destroying him more than he loves the holiness that would save him. 
notwithstanding all the horrible accompaniments of sin in heathen society the wretched creature prefers to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season rather than come out and separate himself from the unclean thing and begin that holy warfare and obedience to which his god and saviour invite him this we repeat proves that the sin is not forced upon the rational creature for if he hated his sin nay if he felt weary and heavy laden because of it he would leave it the christian missionary announces a free grace and a proffered assistance of the holy ghost of which he may avail himself at any moment had he the feeling of the weary and penitent prodigal the same father's house is ever open for his return and the same father seeing him on his return though yet a great way off would run and fall upon his neck and kiss him but the heart is hard and the spirit is utterly selfish and the will is perverse and determined and therefore the natural knowledge of god and his law which this sinner possesses by his very constitution and the added knowledge which the efforts of benevolent christians have imparted to him are not strong enough to overcome his inclination and induce him to break off his sins by righteousness to him also as well as to every sin-loving man these solemn words will be spoken in the day of final adjudication the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of god is manifest within them for god hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him even his eternal power and godhead are clearly seen from the creation of the world being understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god the subject which we have thus discussed is exceedingly fertile in its inferences and teachings but we shall limit ourselves to two that have a direct bearing upon the enterprise of foreign missions one in the first place it is evident that if the positions that have been taken are correct natural religion consigns the entire pagan world to eternal perdition strictly speaking it is not christianity that sends the race of mankind to hell but it is ethics christ himself says that he came not into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved men are condemned already previous to redemption by the law written on their hearts by their natural convictions of moral truth by natural religion whose truths and dictates they have failed to put in practice those theorists therefore who reject revealed religion and remand man back to the first principles of ethics and morality as the only religion that he needs send him to a tribunal that damns him tell me says st paul ye that desire to be under the law do ye not hear the law the law is not of faith but the man that doeth them shall live by them circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law but if thou be a breaker of the law thy circumcision is made uncircumcision if man had been true to all the principles and precepts of natural religion it would indeed be religion enough for him but he has not been thus true the entire list of vices and sins recited by st paul in the first chapter of romans is as contrary to natural religion as it is to revealed and it is precisely because the pagan world has not obeyed the principles of natural religion and is under a curse and a bondage therefore that it is in perishing need of the truths of revealed religion little do those know what they are saying when they propose to find a salvation for the pagan in the mere light of natural reason and conscience what pagan has ever realized the truths of natural conscience in his inward character and his outward life what pagan is there in all the generations that will not be found guilty before the bar of natural religion what heathen will not need an atonement for his failure to live up even to the light of nature nay what is the entire sacrificial cultus of heathenism but a confession that the whole heathen world finds and feels itself to be guilty at the bar of natural reason and conscience the accusing voice within them wakes their forebodings and fearful looking for of divine judgment and they endeavour to propitiate the offended power by their offerings and sacrifices two 
in the second place it follows inevitably from these positions of st paul concerning the guilt of the pagan that nothing but revealed religion can save him from an eternity of sin and woe our lord jesus christ well knew the significance of his last command to his apostles and his church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he knew what a measure and degree of moral truth had been wrought into the structure of the millions of mankind he knew that there is a light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world he knew that that truth had been held in unrighteousness and that that light had shined in the darkness that comprehended it not he knew that upon the plane of natural religion and conscience the responsible creature stood a guilty criminal that he was without excuse that he was utterly unsheltered and must be pierced through and through by the glittering shafts of the law which he had known and which he had violated the incarnation of the eternal son of god is entirely unintelligible except upon the supposition that every human creature is a guilty creature and this guilt is inconceivable except upon the supposition that when he knew god he glorified him not as god it is this dark and awful fact which the church of christ is continually to keep in mind the whole world lieth in wickedness and wickedness is crime and crime must either be cancelled by the blood of the god-man or be punished through endless ages we are summoned to take the same view of this wretched and sinful world which the founder of christianity took we are to look through his eyes and breathe his spirit his eyes are a flame of fire and pierce through all the self-deceptions by which man would extenuate or nullify his sin and his spirit is that of self-sacrificing love to the guilty if the man of sorrows saw in the mass of mankind a mass of perdition his followers must see the same if in the midst of all his tenderness and self-sacrificing love for the human soul he never uttered a single word that leads us to suppose that that soul merits anything but hell punishment or will receive anything but this if it stands upon its own merits in the day of judgment if the pitiful son of god and son of man in all his various representations of the eternal future never spoke a syllable that can be tortured into the theory of the innocency of any human being be he jew or gentile barbarian scythian bond or free young or old then the disciple is to be as the master the church of christ must look out upon the millions of india china and africa as the son of god looked down upon them from the heights of the eternal throne and must behold in them millions upon millions of guilty and lost moral agents like him they must engage in efforts for their salvation and not waste their energies in futile queryings and doubtings the problems before the eternal mind respecting the sin and salvation of man were far more difficult of solution than those which beset the mind of the christian or the sceptic for our lord and saviour knew infallibly how many millions upon millions of the race for whom he proposed to pour out his life-blood would reject him he knew long beforehand how many millions upon millions of this miserable and infatuated race would resist and ultimately quench the only spirit that could renovate and save them the chequered career of the christian church its alternating progress and decline in different ages and countries the unfaithfulness of his own redeemed and their lukewarmness in obeying his parting command to evangelize the nations the whole career of christianity so discouraging in many of its aspects lay distinct and clear before that omniscient eye but it did not dampen his love or his ardour if we may use such a word for an instant even to his own view much of his love and self-sacrifice would run to waste so far as the actual redemption of immortal souls is concerned he knew that like his prophet he was to stretch out his hand all day long yea, ages after ages, to a disobedient and a gainsaying race. But he never faltered and he never hesitated. He veiled his deity in the muddy vesture of decay, and suffered and died in it with the same willingness and alacrity as if he had foreknown that every human soul would have welcomed the great salvation. Now if our Lord and Master, knowing infallibly that millions upon millions would trample upon his blood, and that millions upon millions through the unfaithfulness of his own church would never even hear of the passion in gethsemane and calvary 
if our lord and master in the face of these discouragements while sternly as the eternal nemesis of god charging home an infinite guilt upon the human race yet tenderly as a mother for a child received upon his own person the awful vengeance of that nemesis we and all his people in all time must breathe in his spirit and imitate his example we have no infinite and infallible knowledge by which to discourage us in our efforts at human salvation we know not who will reject the message or whether any will we cannot look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not we only know that the blood of jesus christ cleanses all sin from every soul upon whom it drops and we know that our redeemer and king has commanded us to proclaim this fact to every human creature events and successes are with him the church has nothing to do but obey orders like soldiers in a campaign the great and the simple work before the church is to sprinkle the nations with the blood of atonement this it does instrumentally when it preaches forgiveness of sins through christ's oblation the one great and awful fact in human history we have seen is the fact of guilt and the great and glorious fact which the mercy of god has now set over against it is the fact of atonement it requires no high degree of civilization to apprehend either of these facts the benighted pagan is as easily convicted as the most highly educated philosopher and his reception of the atonement of god is perhaps even less hindered by pride and prejudice let the church therefore dismissing all secondary and inferior aims however excellent and desirable in themselves go forth and proclaim to all the nations that they are without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god and also that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life the guilt of the pagan by william g t shed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org